And joining us now on the debate, Mark Winfield, environmental studies professor at York University. Chris Tyndall, former Green Party strategist and candidate. Ben Dacus, policy analyst at the C.D. Howe Institute. And Christina Blizzard, Queens Park columnist with Sun Media. Good to have you all around the table today. And I want to just completely mix things up here. Even though we're doing something on the Green Party, I want to start with education policy. Because, Chris, you heard him talk about what he'd do with the school system today. What, what pricked up your ears there? Well, I think that this is quite a, a shift from the 07 election when uh, the Greens were talking about one public publicly funded school system by which we read that he would do away with the Catholic system or it would somehow be absorbed into the uh, into the public system. So I think that this is quite a shift and there's a, a certain amount of waffling going on about, oh, well, we would have a commission, we'd have input, we'd have uh, our citizens' assembly he's on this. Off it? I think he's backing off, which I'm a little surprised about because a lot of people attribute the Greens' um, rather, rather good showing, or it was 8%, whatever, which is quite high for them, uh, to the, the one public school system policy last time out. Chris, they backing off that, do you think? I think, I mean, I heard Mike say that he still supports uh, one school system, but he's concerned about the way that they went about it and makes, wants to make sure that everyone's brought along. So I think, I think I agree that there's definitely a softening of the messaging. Like, there's no question that in the last election there was a, there was a harder line uh, around that. It sounds like the objective's still the same, but maybe the uh, methodology's a bit changed. I do, it, it now occurs to me, have to be careful when I talk to this side of the table, that you are Christina and you are Chris, because if I just go Chris and Chris, I'm going to make our director crazy here. <laughs> so, okay, moving forward then, let's just, if we would, Michael, share some of the green policy energy highlights right now. For example, tax credits for energy-saving retrofits in houses, uh, they are opposed to new nuclear facilities. You heard the leader say that. Importing hydroelectric energy from Quebec and Manitoba as needs be. Increased local control over renewable energy projects. $238 million in tax credits over four years for fuel efficient and electric cars. These are just a few of the Green Party's ideas. And Mark, let me start with you on this. Uh, what's the best idea on the environment you've heard the Greens put forward in this campaign so far? I think there are a number of things. I think the emphasis on energy efficiency and cogeneration is, is very welcome and a, and a very important element of the conversation. I think the idea of introducing some form of carbon tax is also very interesting. That they've, they've gone somewhere where the other parties have, have quite explicitly refused to go, despite the calls from the environmental commissioner to go there. And I think re-injecting some energy into the nuclear debate as well, I think is very helpful as well. Ben, what do you say? Well, I like the plan for better integration of Ontario's electricity system with Quebec. And the big reason for that is that there are a lot of complementarities between Ontario and Quebec in any case. But it's becoming especially important with Ontario's increased reliance on wind power. What's happening is that, especially during the night, we're, have, we're seeing very frequent uh, surplus base load generation. So what we effectively need to do is we need to use Quebec as a gigantic battery for Ontario's electricity system. Gotcha. Christina, what do you like about what you've heard about the green energy proposal so far? Well, um, I'm not terribly, um, I'm not terribly bowled over by their, their plan. I, what do I like about it? I'm gonna ask you in a second what you don't like. I, I, do, think, like. I do think some of the ideas of having um, more locally based projects, I think that is a good idea. But having been to some of the areas where uh, wind turbines and so forth are, are being built, I have heard a lot of negative comments from people in rural Ontario who do feel that this is being foisted on them and they, a lot of communities don't like them. Chris Tindall, has that been a problem for, in fact, all of the parties that are advancing wind power as an issue, insofar as, certainly you hear this about the Liberal government, that this is something directed from Queen's Park and that local input hasn't been adequately sought. Is that a problem? I think so, and it's, it's unfortunate because uh, you know, someone like me believes it's so important that we do make those investments, and so it's, it's upsetting to see what I think has been an unnecessary level of of antagonism and and uh, not bringing people along as part of the process, not making sure that there are the local benefits, the community involvement. So I, I want to take the opportunity to agree with Christina uh, that I think that is a really uh, important part of the of the platform. Let me write down that this yeah, took place. Right. How See? far into our discussion? <laughs> that's right. Okay. Uh, what have you heard you don't like, Christina? Well, um, when I was in uh, you, Lake Huron on the. Um, uh, coast, the Lake Huron coast, uh, where people ha have had what they consider wind turbines. These are hundreds of wind turbines that are very, very tall, uh, and they are very damaging to the economy. The people say, if you're running a bed and breakfast in on Lake Huron, 
very few people want to come and visit you if you're surrounded by 300 massive wind turbines that are you know hundreds of feet tall so I think that a lot of this needs to be rethought and and discussed and I think we need more details from uh, from the Green Party on just what exactly they mean we hear these very high-flying ideals but we don't get the details of how this breaks down in rural Ontario and do we have evidence at this stage that in fact tall unsightly as some would call them wind turbines are a disincentive to tourism or other economic activity well, I'm not sure about the specific, uh, that specific problem, but there are a number of additional problems with wind power. I think that the biggest one is, A, the cost. And so, but the cost comes through a number of ways. One is the, through the feed-in tariff, and we're only starting to really see feed-in tariff uh, projects come online. But I think a, a bigger additional problem with uh, a very big expansion of wind power is uh, the surplus generation that we're going to see, and that's going to cause uh, system planning problems. Where what we're seeing right now is we're seeing sort of the start of the cost of, um, of uh, surplus generation. So we're paying wind generators 13 and a half cents to buy that electricity. But then there's so much electricity that we need to offload it and we need to actually pay people uh, in uh, other places to take that electricity. So this is causing system pr uh, planning problems and we need to think about uh, how we can get out of these, um, get out of this cost, this high cost uh, energy problem. Have the benefits of wind uh, by the Greens and others been oversold? I don't think so. I think if you're looking to phase out coal, which now all of the major parties have agreed on, if you're looking at advancing the overall sustainability of the system, making progress on climate change, renewables and wind are going to have to be part of the picture. Uh, in terms of costs, we need to keep in mind that the, the current electricity cost is not a good reference point in terms of assessing the costs of the alternatives going forward. Uh, we need to look at new wind versus new gas versus new nuclear. And when you do that, the picture doesn't look so bad at all. Uh, there are real questions about whether new, real, new nuclear is even on the table as an option at this stage, given what's happened with the Atomic Energy of Canada. We know the province recoiled with a bit of sticker shock when it finally got a, a real price in terms of what new build nuclear was going to look like. And that works out by some people's calculations in the range of 20 cents per kilowatt hours, in which case wind at 13.5 doesn't look so bad. Uh, there's been some modeling done as well that looks at, well, what if we didn't proceed with wind under the Green Energy Act, we went somewhere else, the most likely option is gas, and at least looking at the results of that modeling, it looked like it didn't help us very much on the cost side, and indeed exposed us to a whole bunch of additional risks in terms of costs and environmental impacts. Do you agree with his analysis here? Well, not quite. If you look at uh, the cost of nuclear power, nuclear power is probably one of the most cost-effective uh, programs we have. Uh, in Ontario. If you look at current Ontario I, nuclear I, I power. I didn't say that. Not, not a single project's ever come in on time or on budget. But if you still look at the, the costs of uh, providing this electricity, and this includes... Well, only this because includes we were the, able to strand the debt. But this, <laughs> the, cost, the cost includes the, um, the uh, putting away funds, putting away money for uh, nuclear waste uh, retirement, and decommissioning, including those costs. We're still seeing nuclear come in at about 5.5 cents a kilowatt hour. But that's only an operating cost, and what we're trying to get a handle on is what the cost of new build will be. Uh, what we got out of the procurement process was a suggestion that we were looking at 23 to 26 billion in capital costs for new build facilities, which is what caused the province to, to terminate the process. So when you uh, take all that had, into account. And we've had very, very severe cost overruns on the refurbishment projects okay, as well. I mean, Bruce has, Bruce has blown through its own worst case estimate in terms of the potential cost overruns on the refurbishment. Let me go to Christine on this. Is it helpful or harmful to the Green Party's platform, in your view, that they don't want nuclear as part of the mix going forward? Well, I think it's harmful. I mean, I, I, I think the problem most people see with um, solar and wind is that, you know, General Motors is not going to run, you know, one of their plants on, on solar and wind. You know, they need, uh, we have to have an efficient uh, base load supply, and nuclear is the best way to do that, especially if we're shutting down the, the coal plant plants. Uh, that was essentially 20% of, uh, of the power that was taken offline. I mean, you'll remember when the, when the Liberals first said uh, they were going to shut the coal, coal plants, it was going to be by 2007. Mm -hmm. So I think we're used to having unrealistic promises about what you can shut down um, and what 
you know, what you need in our energy mix. It, what sounds very good in opposition, it may sound good in election platform, perhaps once you become government, you understand that uh, you still have to keep the uh, assembly lines running, and nuclear is the best way to do that. In fairness to Mike Schreiner, he has said he's not shutting any nukes down. He's going to yeah. wait till they run through their natural course. But if the, if the Green Party were a little more bullish on, on nuclear power, do you think that would get them more votes? I don't know. I just I just don't think we can afford it. I mean, I tend to agree with Mark's analysis of the numbers, and I think that the the way you, you can tell that uh, that governments don't really want to pay for nuclear is you ask them, well, are you going to cover the cost overruns or not? Because a private company will come forward and say, well, it's going to cost us X to build this plant, thirty billion dollars, as long as you guys pay for whatever it actually ends up costing, which can be twice that or three times that. And all of a sudden, the government says, well, I, I don't know if I'm not that interested. At least they should. And that's that's what the Green Party says actually in its platform. It says, listen, we don't support the construction of a new nuclear option. If that's going to happen, if for you know for some reason the Green Party say doesn't form the government next time, but they have uh, a member of provincial parliament that can influence decisions, then the second best option is to make sure that costs are not being passed on to the public. That that uh, if there are cost overruns by a private company, they need to cover them. And as soon as you say that, uh, all of a sudden the the price tag changes a bit because the private company has to admit the but full cost. If you care about global warming and obviously everybody who follows the Green Party does, there is a debate about whether or not nuclear is good, right? Mm -hmm. There is no carbon dioxide that goes up a stack when you're running a nuclear power plant. So some, I mean, the co-founder of Greenpeace is now a complete mm -hmm. convert on this, right? He likes nuclear power now. Right. How come more Greens don't? Well, I mean, there is there is that debate. I think uh, I know I know that for me and and reading the Green Party of Ontario's platform, it does come down to that cost. I think I think what what the Green Party of Ontario is trying to do is look at all the different energy options, trying to figure out a supply mix that is the most efficient and makes the most sense. They've said the most way we can save people money is by saving them energy, which is why they're going to focus on conservation and efficiency, um, and that the price of renewables is coming down, whereby the price of nuclear tends to double or triple and and comes with all those long term unknowns. It's you know insurance is a big question that we haven't talked about. They're not really insured for for the amount of, a, of of what a disaster would cost. So there's a lot of extra costs that come with nuclear. And I think when you look at the full cost and you compare it to the true cost of renewables, people are saying nuclear is maybe not the most efficient way to achieve our our uh, energy objectives. Okay, let's move on to the next major plank in the Greens platform, and uh, we're calling this segment a free range chicken in every pot, by which we want to talk about food. Because of uh, all the four main mainline parties in Ontario, uh, the Greens have devoted more of their kind of time, effort, mental energy to farming and food policies. And if we could, Michael, let's bring this up here. For example, the Green Party highlights in food and farming policy include creating nutrition and cooking classes, community gardens, and healthy food programs in schools, support by local campaigns, invest in rural infrastructure such as farmer co-ops, agricultural research and development, and food distribution hubs. They're offering $760 million in tax credits over four years for farmers, and they want to end the one-size-fits-all regulations for family farms. Uh, the devotion, uh, Mark Winfield, to this much attention on food and farming, uh, why is the party doing this, do you think, in your view, and is it wise? I think it's wise. I think it probably plays well to its base. I think it reflects areas where they think they've got some potential electoral strength, particularly in the, the sort of peri-urban fringe around the greater Toronto area in Simcoe County, places like that, where there are a lot of interesting conversations starting to happen about different models for agriculture which focus on production for local consumption, organic, sort of moving away from the traditional high intensity commodity export kind of orientation of agriculture. So I, th I think that's where this is coming from and that there has been quite a lot of interesting thinking going, going on in Ontario about precisely these sorts of issues in those regions. Any objection to anything on that list? Well, it's certainly very good politics for an Ontario election uh, to come out and support the Ontario farmer because their lower cost competitors in California or in South America don't get the vote. And so it's not very good uh, economic policy because those producers in California in South America have not only lower costs that are going to be passed on to Ontario consumers, but if you look at the environmental impact of, uh, of say, the amount of energy it takes to get uh, food from South America or uh, from, from California to, uh, to Ontario, it's actually not that much. And if you look at a UK study, a UK government study showed that, uh, say, growing a tomato in the UK actually emits four times the amount of greenhouse gases as uh, a tomato grown in, say, Spain. So the, the local, the local um, say, greenhouse gases 
the local so from, from greenhouse are much much higher than say from uh, the transport costs the transport emissions Christina, anything on this list that you find objectionable? Uh, no, I, I actually I find this probably one of the most attractive parts of their platform, and I think uh, I, I agree that it is it does speak to their base, it speaks to two of, two of their bases. I think not just the farmers, which that where they showed considerable strength in the last election, but I think also I think a lot of young people really uh, want to move away from. Uh, we've had so many food recalls of you know questionable tainted food from overseas. Uh, that people really are interested in food safety, and I think they like and trust Ontario farmers. I think in the wake of Walkerton, uh, the the focus on you know healthy farming is very important to um, to people in this province. And I think if you look at the Niagara Peninsula, particularly where. Um, Farmers were burning, you know, cherry trees and peach trees. I mean, this sort of iconic part of the province that has for so long been associated, sort of been the garden of the province. Suddenly, uh, farmers were burning peach trees, burning cherry trees after they closed, I think it was the Cangro Cannery in uh, St. Catharines. Suddenly, all our canned food now comes from China. I think people, uh, I remember writing about it at the time, and a great many people in the province are, are very upset. They like to think of this uh, of, of the Niagara Peninsula, uh, as Ontario as a whole, as, as a good, healthy food producer. And I think that that policy probably speaks very well to that. Chris, talk to us about, this is Christopher now, Christopher Tyndall, talk to <laughs> us about the, uh, the politics of this insofar as the conventional wisdom would suggest that these seats in rural Ontario, which have been conservative almost since Confederation, are untouchable, and that all the good you know, green and food policy in the world is not going to get them to move. Is that accurate, do you think? In, there, there was a, I don't know how true this story was, but in the last election, somebody told me a story that at all candidates' debates in rural Ontario, the Greens were handing out copies of their agricultural policy along with the Conservative agricultural policy, because that's how confident they were um, that theirs were, was better. And I, I think that uh, Christine is right, that they did see some uh, support pick up there. Um, so, so I do think it's, I, I do think it's, it's good politics, and it's, I think it's also uh, good for the province because I think that they're the you know, small, small and medium-sized farms are under a lot of stress, um, are finding it very difficult to to survive in the regulatory and marketing environment that's been created. Um, so I think I'm, I'm I'm glad. I think it's something that uh, it's good that it's being addressed at this level by a, by one of the four major parties. Mark Winfield, one thing we don't actually see in the platform is something you might call a fat tax, and we had Tim Grant, who's the Green candidate in Trinity mm -hmm. Spadina, on this program a few nights ago, and he talked about how he wished uh, we had something like a junk food tax or something like that that you could put in vending machines at schools, for example, uh, to take that money. Uh, through unhealthy lifestyle and redirected towards healthier options for kids. Should that have been in the platform? That's up to the Green Party. It's an interesting idea. Mm -hmm. It's kind of an interesting health dimension to it, a classical Peruvian tax to try and discourage a behavior that we don't want to see. Mm -hmm. um, I think uh, there are lots of other interesting things in this platform as well, though, uh, that uh, some way cover some of that territory as well. Like what? Well, I think even the carbon tax in some ways is, although the actual level that they're proposing is very, very marginal, it sort of starts us down a path that, that moves us away from carbon intensive foods and inputs and those sorts of things. And I think that might capture some of those types of highly processed foods as well. Ben, would you like to have seen a, uh, I know what the answer is, but I'm going to ask this anyway. Would, you, would it have been wise to put a um, uh, a fat tax or a soda pop tax or junk food tax as part of the platform as well? I don't think so, uh, but I, I, agree, uh, I agree with the idea of uh, moving towards a carbon tax. Uh, the Peruvian principle of applying taxes is a, is a good way of starting. And so what, what we need to Can do in Canada... Can you say again? The CD Institute agrees that moving towards a carbon tax is well, a good idea? It's, uh, we don't have institutional positions, but, it's the, <laughs> but the, 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 the fundamental point is that we, a, a tax is going to be a much better way of dealing with the environmental uh, and environmental side effects of greenhouse gases rather than all these this picking and choosing of what we think is the best policy. Should it be these uh, building um, retrofits? Should it be wind power? Should it be whatever? All these subsidies, we have this great Canadian myth that we can reduce emissions through subs subsidization programs. That's not been effective, be it a challenge, a, a program, or whatever. We need, if we're going to be serious about uh, reducing emissions, we need to start with a price on carbon. That could be through a cap-and-trade system or a carbon tax. You know the only problem with that, 
Christina Blizzard would be the first person to write a column saying what a dumb idea it was, wouldn't you? Oh, absolutely. If that's um, the only problem with it, though. Then let's do yeah. it, right? Is that <laughs> go, go, go. <laughs> but, but please, feel free. Go right ahead. <laughs> what, what would be your objection to doing that? Um, I, uh, I, I don't think that um, I don't think that cap and trade or uh, uh, carbon taxes. I mean, the, the, the carbon tax that the uh, uh, that the Green Party is proposing, I think, is ten dollars per ton. Uh, which puts two point, would put 2.4 cents a liter onto uh, uh, gasoline, uh, which may sound terrific to all of us sitting around uh, the table here. We can take the subway uh, home, and the rest of the province, though, relies very heavily. You go to northern Ontario, people in northern Ontario rely very heavily on gasoline. They're already playing, paying more for gasoline than we are. Uh, if you ask them to pay another 2.4 cents a litre, uh, it's, it's really unreasonable, and it's a, a consumption gas, a t consumption tax on something which for many people, perhaps not in the urban centers, but for many people in this province, is a consumption tax on uh, something they need every day. Couldn't you play around with the tax code, though, and, and I don't know, fix it so that people who lived in more remote areas could get some kind of tax break? But this is what, this is what the, um, the liberals have been doing um, with, their, uh, with the HST, uh, because they brought in the, the HST, on, uh, ho which, which applied to home heating and uh, electricity. So suddenly, they found themselves in this great sort of uh, rewind, having to find some way to give, they have a Northern Ontario credit uh, and you know, if it doesn't work, it doesn't work. Perhaps you should think it through. Mark? I, I disagree, actually. I think that if you have particular constituencies that are adversely affected by these kinds of measures, then it makes sense to make interventions to deal with the circumstance of those particular constituencies, but not to throw the baby out with the bathwater. And particularly in the case of a carbon tax, if we're going to make any progress on reducing greenhouse gas emissions and getting to a position where we avoid dangerous carbon, dangerous climate change, we're going to have to put a price on carbon somehow. And I think the Greens do deserve some credit for having the courage to put that on the table in, in this election. Have they done it adequately? They haven't put a huge price on carbon in this plan. Oh, I never think they go far enough. I'm a, I'm a crazy radical. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's one of the funny things. If you ask me what I don't like about the platform, I'd say, oh, it's too moderate and realistic. You know, that's, Not it's got to be crazier. But this is the frustrating <laughs> thing about, uh, about carbon pricing debate in Canada, I think, is that you've got pretty much consensus amongst, you've got a lot of econo uh, economists, a lot of environmentalists, all near consensus, certainly a vast majority, saying that a price on carbon is the way to go. Um, and yet you've only got one party in, uh, in four major parties in this election proposing it. Um, it's nice to have that as a wedge if you're the Green Party. I'd like to see it more involved in the debate, especially as, as Mike Schreiner just said, of how successful it is in the British Columbian experiment. So we can, we can follow their lead. And, and $10 is, is, a, is a start. And, and uh, I think that's a big part of it is making sure you also bring people along as you go and, and that you're consulting adequately so you don't create a backlash that ends up hurting your cause more than more than you intended. You wouldn't be talking about the 2008 federal election by chance, would I, you? I don't have any memory of a 2008 election. No, I didn't think so, <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, folks, we've got about five minutes left here, and I want to put two more things on the table. You saw in the last federal election that the Greens took a lot of their energy out of running a truly national campaign, and they put a lot of resources into winning one seat. And they did. But it cost them half their votes nationwide. And you heard Mike Schreiner earlier on the program say, if they could replicate that provincially, they'd go for it. What's wiser, winning that one seat but losing half your votes, or building the movement nationally even if you don't win a seat? Christina. Well, it's, it's a tough call, but I would say having a seat in the legislature helps. I mean, you, you're not going to have official party status, so you're not going to get that many questions. You're not going to get the kind of dollars that go with official party status. Um, if you're um, astute, you are able to make a lot of noise there, which actually I think we have to give credit to Mike Schreiner. He is managing to do very well. I think he's been a very good leader in that respect. Um, I, I would think that having a seat at the table uh, has to, um, in our first past the post system, has to be the number one priority. Uh, but, but to lose that much of the of the popular vote, I think, was a fairly big sacrifice. 
Chris, where would you be on this strategic decision? I, I think that it was the right decision because I agree that I think I think winning the seat was was the most important thing. It's the most important metric of success at that point in the federal party's history for sure. I mean, the federal party pretty much needed to win a seat, or or it was its future was in question. Um, that said, I think there are a lot of people who who felt like that the the support that declined nationally. Um, Maybe there was too much of a moving of resources, uh, not as much focus on a national campaign. And that's a concern that's been expressed, uh, I think, internally and some people in the federal party. So you, I, you have to do a bit of both. I think it's right to focus on trying to break through and having that beachhead, but you can't only focus on one riding. You need to make sure that you're continuing to make your other candidates feel like they're supported because these people are, are volunteers. Um, and then if, if, they, if they feel like the, the, main, the head office of the party has, has abandoned them, then you don't have a team for next time. Mark, what's your view on that? Depends on your view of how you understand the party's role. Uh, from the perspective of uh, maximizing policy influence, there's a case to be made that you actually want to maximize your share of the popular vote because you want to demonstrate that there's a body of voters out there who are prepared to make voting decisions based on environmental issues. And the way you do that is by maximizing your vote, which, which is clearly they, they lost ground. I think there are a number of variables that were in play in the last federal election. It wasn't just the decision to focus on, on the one riding. No, Elizabeth May it, also it, didn't get into the leaders' debate. She didn't get into the leaders' well. debate, but there were also bigger questions around where environmental issues mm -hmm. were in the overall public debate versus other issues sure. as well, which I think are part of what are playing out here in Ontario. So it really is, is, is there's a trade-off because the party can't do both, and it really does come down to a more fundamental question are you are you there because you're seeking power as, and party status or are you there to be a vehicle as a way of injecting some of the ideas that we've been talking about around this table into the political conversation and demonstrating that there's a constituency of support around those that the other parties might want to think about as well Ben last thing where are the greens on the ideological spectrum as you look at them well, as I look at it, uh, they, they can be anywhere you like, in that uh, there can be uh, some good policies that economists are going to embrace, uh, such as uh, starting to introduce uh, Pigovian taxation. Uh, but there are other things, this sort of industrial policy mix, this sort of um, going after uh, like the industrial policy that we see with the feed and tariff through uh, uh, these local procurement needs. These are not, uh, these sorts of green policies are, are probably not, uh, not something you'd see a conservative uh, support or an economist support, uh, but uh, they, they, can, they can fit wherever you like. Where do you see them, Christine? Because they, they, they like tax cuts for business, but they're also against nuclear. I know. I think it's a very sort of niche market, that they're, and I think they're directing themselves um, uh, to young people and to, uh, oddly, rural Ontario, um, which is a curious niche to carve out and very difficult, I would think, but I, I agree. I don't think they're either on the, they're on the left and on the right, uh, it's a bit of a mishmash. I know that, Chris, is very old thinking. We want to know, are you a right wing or are you a left wing party? And you're a very young person. So help us understand where you are on the political spectrum. I, I, that was always one of the most challenging questions I had to answer if I was representing the Green door-to-door, because -door, people want a clear answer. If you can't give one, it, it sounds like you don't stand for anything. Um, and I think the problem is that for a lot of people, left and right is, is becoming a bit outdated. And so you say, you know, you're being given these choices. You're saying environmentalism means you're left. And wanting a strong economy means you're right. And there are a set of policies that a lot of people believe can benefit both. And those are the policies that the Green Party tries to advance. Um, but then you don't fit on the, on the, on the spectrum very well. So uh, it's, it's a challenge in terms of communication. There's little rhetorical flourishes mm. that the party, you know, not left or right, but out front or you know, those sorts of things, uh, forward thinking rather than ideologically thinking. But uh, it, it is a challenge of communication. But I, yeah, I don't, I don't know where to place myself or the party because I, I think that, you know, the, the Green Party comes from a set of values and objectives, I think, more than ideology. Gotcha. And so that's where the policies end up getting created. Well, we are happy to have placed you at this table today for this discussion. I want to thank the two Chris's on this side of the table, Christina Blizzard from the Toronto Sun, Chris Tindall, the former Green Party strategist and candidate, and on the other side of the table, Mark Winfield from York University, Ben Dacus from the C.D. Howe Institute. Thanks for this, everybody.